First of all, I'd like to thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, I know you've got a myriad of other things you could do on a nice fall evening like this, but I think it shows a lot about how you feel about public education, public education in Fairview Park in particular, uh, to come out. For those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Brian Deitch. I'm the superintendent of schools here in Fairview Park. Uh, it's been a privilege to serve this district. Uh, I've got my board members are here. If you want to raise your hand, board members, there's Jocelyn and Tim and Joe Shikovsky. Uh, we've got Tanya Foos as a candidate, Katie Davis. I thought I saw Katie Davis come in. There she is. Uh, thank you for coming out. Mayor Patton, this is horrible, this light. I don't ever want to be a star. but. Uh, uh, very appreciative of Mayor Patton and the work that we've been able to do with the schools. But the real heroes about what we do in our schools every day are, are my principals and uh, Barb Brady, Brady Sheets, Chris Vicker, Ray Moore, Connie O'Bricky, Trisha Moran. Uh, they're the ones that make it happen, and I want to publicly thank them for what they do. To, for me to tell you that it's an absolute privilege to introduce our speaker tonight would be one of the bigger understatements that I've ever made. Uh, Dr. Willard Daggett is one of the leading reformers in education in America. Um, and I'll embarrass him, but I absolutely do think he's the best. I've heard a myriad of guys from Daniel Pink and everybody in between, and uh, I really am appreciative of his work. He's going to make you think. He's going to challenge you. He's going to make you feel good about we do, what we do. He might make you not feel so good about what we do. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Daggett, and then I'm going to turn it over to him. Uh, he started his career uh, a few years before I did. I'll just leave it at that. How was that? Okay. <laughs> A few years before I did, in, in upstate New York, he was a teacher, and administrator. Uh, at one point in his career, he was in charge of curriculum with the, with the Board of Regents in, in New York State. Uh, he uh, founded the International Center for Leadership and Education. He's got a great family that I know he's going to tell you about. Uh, but to give you an idea of what a privilege it is for us to have Bill here in, in Fairview Park today, this is his schedule this week. Tomorrow morning at 6.30, he gets on a plane, he flies to Orlando does a presentation. On Wednesday, he, gets, he goes to Washington, D.C., and along with Juan Williams and a few other people, he is a keynoter at a conference in Washington, D.C. On Thursday, he'll be in Kansas City to address the Kansas and Missouri school superintendents. They do theirs together. And then on Friday, he goes to Boston. On Monday, he's in Fairview Park, which I know is the highlight of his week. So anyway, with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Willard Daggett. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Good evening to everyone. Good evening. Um, before I start, I want to find out a little bit about some of you. Um, how many of you have Easy Pass? Okay. Uh, how come you have Easy Pass? Give me a reason why you. It's faster. Why do you have it? Because you don't have to carry money. Anybody got another reason? Yeah, it's cheaper. Good. Uh, how many do online banking? Okay. Uh, why? Is it many of the same reasons? Okay. How many do not do online banking? For some of you who do not, why? You don't trust it. Okay. Yeah. By the way, does anybody who does online banking before you started doing it, didn't totally trust it? A little afraid? But now would you like to go back and not have any more online banking? For anybody who uses Easy Pass, have you ever gone to get on one of the toll roads or off and saw the line of people who are waiting to pay their, a little bit more than you're paying and they get that long line and you basically just wave and say, suckers? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, technology, I will show you tonight, has changed every facet of our lives. I don't really like technology. I'm not especially good at it. But I better figure out how to deal with it. Um, how many have heard that financially, America at a national level has some financial challenges right now? Okay. Now, I'm not talking about the pending government shutdown at midnight. I've, uh, I haven't heard the news today. Is it still on at this point? Still on, okay. But even if it doesn't, does anybody know what happens in another couple weeks? What's the other big issue? National debt. 
and would almost everybody agree that we do as a nation have to figure out some way to get our debt under control because who owns most of our debt? China. Now, if you're going to get the debt under control, there's a couple of things you got. To, you, you can do a couple of different ways. Number one, you can incre increase revenue, which means taxation on some people. Or you can decrease services. So on the federal debt question, I simply have a simple question tonight. Would you, re you prefer to have us increase your personal taxes or decrease the financial support to this school district? Or don't you like either one of those options? See, technology has invaded every facet of our lives. We know that in the 21st century, we've got to get our finances under control. But it's not unique to the federal government. It's not unique to banking. It's not unique to Easy Pass. It's an issue that every school district in this nation has got to come to grips with. The future is going to be financially and technologically different than the past. And so while we agree that you know, the online use of technology is good, so what happens when a school district attempts to go paperless? and begin to send out all their student reports or their information online. What you'll find are some people who resist it. Why? Because they haven't yet used it. But once they use it, there's almost no backing off. There's no going back. I'm going to challenge your assumptions tonight. Brian said it. I'm going to make you feel a little uncomfortable at points. But before I do, let me be very clear what I believe about American education. I have been in every state in America multiple times. I have actually spoken in 29 other countries. And every time I return to America, I thank God I live in America. And one of the reasons is the American education system. I believe, having seen it up close and personal, that the US education system is the finest education system literally in the world. It has no parallel. Now, you don't have the highest standards. If you think America in general, and Ohio in particular, has rigorous academic standards, I am going to badly depress you tonight. So you might say, well, wait a minute. How can he say we got the best schools if we don't have the highest standards? For one simple reason. Which kids in America do we educate, folks? All. And the second you educate all kids, because we have this dual commitment to excellence and equity, international comparisons are unfair. But you know what is not unfair? Your kids are going to have to compete against high school graduates from other nations. That's not unfair. That is reality. When I look at schools, I don't look at them as a lifetime educator. I look at them as a parent and a grandparent. My wife, Bonnie, and I, we have five kids, uh, older than most of your kids because they're older than a lot of you, but not everybody in the room, okay? Okay? Um, <laughs> uh, my kids are 39, 40, 41, 42, and 43. And uh, yeah, it's all I can tell you is it's a lot better than 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. <laughs> but they run the gamut. Uh, the oldest is gifted and talented, not dad's wishful thinking. Second one, pretty good student. Third one, loved to go to school. Just never showed up for any classes once he got there. And you ever, ever had any kids like that? Fourth one, severe mental retardation, autism, and very, very, very serious epilepsy. For Audrey, our fourth child, a great day is any day she doesn't have a grand mal seizure. And there haven't been many in 40 years of her life. And for the first four kids, you know, and when we step back and look from a retrospective pers uh, uh, position, you know what we think is the greatest accomplishment? It's not the oldest daughter who won all the national awards. It's when we worked around the clock with school personnel, support system, and family. We finally got her little sister, Audrey, as a preteen potty trained. Now, until you've lived in that arena, it's hard to comprehend. And a lot of the naysayers to public education have no sense of what we're asking the educators 
in this school district and in this nation to do? Where are the educators in the room? What kids do we ask you to educate again? All. I, I can give you higher perf performing schools. Come with me on my next trip to China. I'll show you higher performing schools. I just thank God I don't live there. Not with my uh, five children. And it was the fifth one that helped us understand as a family how great American schools are. His name is Paul. Paul, we thought, could be anything in the world he wanted to be until 28 years ago, just two weeks ago, September 16th, 28 years ago, at the age of 11, as he stepped off of a school bus, he was run over by a drunken driver. He, spent, he suffered traumatic brain injury. He was in a coma and on life support systems for nine months. Paul lost the functions of speech and hearing. He doesn't have the function of speech and hearing any longer. He has such a taxi that if you saw him with me, you would swear he had severe CP. But he regained his academic skills. It is 28 years later. In America, and only in America, could it happen. He's a four-year college graduate. He doesn't have a good job. He has a great job. He literally makes more money than his older two brothers, which I remind them of often. And they tell me that's because they work for me and he doesn't. Um, <laughs> Paul is married and they have three young boys. Let me begin tonight by saying thanks to every educator in the audience. Thanks for educating every kid. And their challenges are enormous. And if you don't think they're enormous, we're going to try something a little later tonight. I'm going to give you some eighth grade math questions, literally. And I'm going to ask you to try to do them. Because I want to know, are you smarter than an eighth grader? See, our schools today are covering a lot more indicators or standards than any of us had to take when we were kids. They clearly have a lot more tests to take than any of us had to take. And yet, we're graduating more of them than ever before. They got more to cover, and we're graduating more. So why should anybody talk about school reform? It's not because of this line. It's because of my easy pass example. It's because of the banking example. It's because the world has fundamentally and irreversibly changed. Not that I like it, but it's a reality. That is the world outside of school. And how many of you in this room have children in this school district? Let me be very clear. Your kids, not because of this school district, not because of this state, your kids in this nation at this point are the best educated ever in the history of the country and simultaneously the worst off. They're the worst off not because schools are failing, but because the world outside of school, pushed by technology, pushed by globalization, is changing four to five times faster than the rate of change inside of school. And so they become the best educated, but the least prepared for their future. I headed up a national commission. It began six years ago. Uh, I head up a group called the International Center for Leadership and Education. A second group called the Council of Chief State School Officers. Every state in America has either a state superintendent, as you have in Ohio, or a state commissioner. The 50 are called the Council of Chief State School Officers. That group and my group were approached now six years ago by a group of governors and corporate leaders, and we were asked if we would go out across America and try to find the schools that did not look like this line, but instead looked like this line. Or ideally, this line. They said, will you go and find the nation's most rapidly improving schools? The 25 most rapidly improving elementary schools, the 25 most rapidly improving middle schools, and the 25 most rapidly improving high schools out of 47,000 school buildings. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation gave us substantial financial support for the study. We studied, we found, uh, found the schools, we got under the covers of uh, those schools to see what they were doing differently. And I'm gonna try to give you a brief snapshot of what we found tonight. They basically go through three stages. Stage one is why do we need to change schools? the hardest schools in America to change 
are the best schools. How many in your room ever read the book by Jim Collins or ever heard of it? Good to great. Folks, I'm here to challenge your assumptions. Your community exemplifies good to great. We're pretty good. Why would we want to change? Everything's okay. We're going to examine tonight whether it is really okay or not. Because what we learned is until you create a community support for schools to change, you will never be able to change your schools. Level one is getting the community to agree. Level two is getting the employees, the staff, the administration to agree. Level three is getting the kids to understand it. And ladies and gentlemen, see, changing your schools in this school district could be like any other good school district in America. It would be like addressing the national debt. Yeah, change, sure, be good to change. Just make sure they look exactly like the schools I attended when I was there. Change schools, but don't make us do really anything different. Why do you need to change schools? It's the first thing you've got to understand, because culture trumps strategy. I'll show you some things you can do. L let me give you an example. I gave a couple to the staff today. Um, Looping. How many ever heard of looping? The second grade teacher goes to third grade with the class. Anybody in your room want to give me a sense of why you think that would work? Why is that good? Yes? Kids, the teachers know the kids. You know who else they know? Their parents. And their parents know the teacher. There's a relationship. And so what do we do in most American schools? At the end of the school year, we throw it all away and start new. So they're looping their teachers. The second grade teacher goes to third grade with the class. At the end of third grade, they loop back to second. Would they become a better second grade teacher the next time around? How come? They know what the kids need. Kind of common sense, isn't it? It's called relationships. Um, we found it in all 25 of the nation's most rapidly improving elementary schools. 25 middle schools, 25 high schools. There are 50 schools in total. Guess what we found? 47, I'm sorry, 43 of the 50 schools in those two categories doing. Looping their teachers. What grades? Eighth to ninth. Oh my God, doesn't he know they're different buildings? <laughs> How many in this room have a son or a daughter in that general age range? Would you not agree with me that is a tough age for kids? They are physically and emotionally going through changes in their own bodies they have no clue how to deal with. And think about what we do in American education. We take them out of a smaller cloistered environment when they are most fragile and put them in a larger, more disconnected environment. What are they doing in the nation's most rapidly improving schools? They're looping eighth grade teachers up to ninth. Now, not all the eighth grade teachers. There are some eighth grade teachers they never want to see again, okay? But a small cadre. And then they loop them back to eighth the next year. They become a lot better eighth grade teacher the next time around. Relationships are really, really important. So let me give you another characteristic we found in these highest performing schools. Every high school teacher, every four years, is given 25 new students. And the 25 students, on average, they have in their schedule something called a, um, a counseling period. And what is it? Every day, that teacher is with those kids anywhere from 25 to 30 minutes a day. And they get to know the kids. They get to know the kids' parents. They get to find out how the kids are doing in their various other classes. They go talk to the other teachers. They become the advocate for that child in the school. They become the adult they're anchored with, and they stay with that teacher for four straight years. By the end of four years, the, kid, the kids and those teachers, you can't hardly separate them. On graduation night, you see the emotion of it. And when they have a problem, forgive me, parents, 
that teacher might know before you know. And again, they become the advocate. Now, some of the schools do this. Some of the schools then say, okay, when you enter ninth grade, you get to pick your advisor, your counselor. And you might say, well, how do the kids know that? Well, let me ask you, do kids talk to each other? Do parents talk to each other? What do you do? You got the principal, what do I do if I got one teacher that 80 kids want, and I got another teacher that only two kids or no kids want? Anybody work in the private sector? How would you deal with something like that? What would it tell you? It would tell you maybe there's a problem with this other teacher. We don't deal with that stuff in American education. These schools do. They go deeper. I can give you tons and tons of things these schools do. But you're not going to implement them in your school district until there's a culture that will support it. Because, see, it's like the federal de deficit. Everybody agrees we've got to deal with it. But propose an answer, and you become the cat in this picture. And those German shepherds become everybody else. In fact, how many of you could think of a human face you could put right on that dog? And you know who this becomes really uh, difficult for? Even more difficult for than the teachers? It becomes very difficult for the superintendent and the principals, and it becomes very uh, difficult for the school board members because the dog calls and howls a lot. And we are famous in this country for the squeaking wheel getting a lot of attention. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to create a critical mass of people to understand and be in agreement where you're moving in terms of moving forward. I think you had to raise your standards. I'm sorry, your standards are not high enough. Let me tell you why. That's it right there. Everybody understands what that means, right? Ladies and gentlemen, 70%, 7-0, of young people in America today are no longer eligible for the military. It used to be our fallback position. 70% can no longer go in the military. Why? Because you've got to meet five requirements to go into the military. Number one, uh, you have to pass, uh, you have to have a high school diploma. You've got to have a high school diploma. They used to take the GED to go into the military. They will not any longer. Once you have a high school diploma now, and by the way, 30% of young people in America are not receiving high school diplomas. You don't have that problem. You're up in the mid-90s, I believe. So you're pretty good on that one. Second one, however, you will struggle. We'll see before the evening is over. You now have to pass a test once you are a high school graduate to go into the military. And it's a literacy and it's a numeracy test. This test has been around forever, but it used to be used as a placement exam once you were in the military. It's called the ASVAB exam. It is now a placement exam. I mean, it's now an admission exam. Why? Because the technology you have to use in the military is so critical to job performance, and that technology is constantly changing, that you have to be a life long learner in a technological environment. And so you've got to have the math, the science, and the language arts skills that enable you to be a lifelong learner in a technological environment. The military is revamping the ASVAB exam every six months. Why? Because the technology is getting so much more advanced. And what happened? 28% of high school graduates in America last year who took the ASVAB exam, failed it. Now, how do you get all the way up to 70%? Health-related issues, leading the list, obesity. Second, the next item, drug-related issues. Legal-related issues, all the way to incarceration. 
70% of young people in America no longer eligible for the military. And here's a real issue. It's increasing at 1% a year. It's predicted to be 80% within 10 years. The first time I heard this, I heard it from Condoleezza Rice. Her and I were doing a session with a group of governor, governors. But the governors had with them a series of corporate leaders, and they explained it. Connie explained it to them. We go off into some breakout groups, and the corporate leaders there that day, I don't know how else to describe it to you, but to tell you they were livid. And you know why they were so mad? They said, look, if they're not ready for the military, what remotely makes you think they're ready for the 21st century workplace? Yes, they can go to work at a convenient market, but they can't earn enough money to be self-sufficient. Before I go any further, how many in the room have a son or a daughter who is a preteen, a teen, or in their early 20s? For everybody who's just raised your hands, how many of you hope the person you just raised your hands about sometime in the next decade becomes independent? How many do not want them to be independent? And I'll show you a very sick person. <laughs> Let me ask you another question. How many in the room know a recent four-year college graduate who is now back at home with mommy and or dad, or made the decision to go off to graduate school because they couldn't find meaningful employment, or are off on their own, but mom and dad are still having to help pay the bills. Hands way up. Not part way up. Keep them way up high. Keep them way up. Please look around this room. Anybody that doesn't have their hands up? What happened? These are success stories. These are the kids we brag about on graduation night. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your children. And we're paying little attention as a nation. Oh, by the way, let me ask you another question. How many in the room know this could be yourself? Somebody with an outstanding college loan. Look around the room. Uh, we have any elementary teachers with us tonight? You're good. What grades do you teach? First? Okay. Um, first is a little early, but we'll try first. Um, when, you're, when she's teaching first grade and she's teaching math, what would you expect her to be getting the kids ready for? Not a trick question. First, base, first grade math is designed to get kids ready for what? Second grade math. What's the purpose of second grade math? Third. So elementary school math is supposed to get them ready for middle school math. Middle school math is supposed to get them ready for high school math. High school math is supposed to get them ready for until they all fall off the educational ladder. See, there is a new set of standards out there. They're called Common Core State Standards. Whether you like them or don't like them, here's the reality. There are four words under them that few people are paying attention to. They say they are to have kids become college and, anybody know what? Career ready. Not or career ready. And, and a lot of people don't understand why they didn't just say college ready. I'm going to try to show you tonight. Having said that, however, please understand, I want the kids to go to college. But I also, at some point in their life, would like to have them go to work. So we'll come back to that. Ladies and gentlemen, we have 70% of our young people that are basically functionally unemployable today in a job that will pay enough for them to be self-sufficient. And that's what Labor Department report after Labor Department report keeps telling us. And nobody thinks it's their kid. Let me take you deeper. If they cannot obtain employment at a level to be self-sufficient, 
Do you clearly understand what's happening? We have 70 headed to 80% of our young people in this country headed to public assistance. It's unsustainable as a nation. And that's why we have this whole school reform piece, which is not new. It's been around forever. The school reform piece, the drumbeat just keeps getting louder. Uh, anybody remember what national report came out about American education way back in 1983? The nation at risk. And we were really frightened because one nation had technologically passed America by. Anybody know what nation it was? Japan. Is anybody in this room so old that you can remember the 1960s? Okay. Many of us can. Many of you are too young. And a couple in the back that didn't raise their hands over here must have been doing things in the 60s <laughs> that made the whole decade look like a blur to them over here. What did made in Japan mean in the 1960s? Junk. Shoddy workmanship. By 1983, world class. How did they do it in two decades? 1983, nobody was talking about China. Today, our fiercest economic competitor. But what did made in China mean in the 80s? Junk. 1990s, nobody was talking about India. Today, our second fiercest economic competitor. When I addressed a group of these governors, I was asked to speak about one thing. I head up the International Center. There are five nations that, despite a worldwide recession, five nations that, despite a worldwide recession, have had five straight years of double-digit growth in their economies, and four of those five nations are poised to equal or surpass the U.S. economy in the next decade and a half. And what they simply said to me was this, see if you agree. They said they think there's a direct and intimate link between educational achievement and the probability of future economic success. That the better you do educationally, the greater your chances of future economic success. So they said, will you simply come and tell us what those five nations are doing different educationally than we are? Can anybody in the auditorium tell me what the five nations are, except for those that were with me this morning. <laughs> They're not China and India, because see, China and India are already there. Five fastest growing economies in the world. Rank order, number one, Vietnam. Means something quite different to my generation. Number two, Argentina. Number three, Brazil. Number four, Indonesia. Number five, will never surpass the US economy, it's way too small of a nation, but it's growing quickly, Panama. And she's right, China and India and Japan, they're not going away. You know who is fading and fading very quickly in a global economy? Europe. And who do we look and act more like? Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, the business leaders were scared down to their toenails. But you know what else scares them? Is this data right here. This is the US population. Going up the left hand side is the American by age group. So the bottom line, zero to four year olds, 1950. That bottom line are the first five years of baby boomers. In 1950 in America, we had more children under five than total national population above 55. Just think about that for a moment. We had more children under five than total national population above 55. And in the late 50s into the 60s, that's the beginning of what we call the Great Society, and did it beginning in 63 with uh, President Johnson. And that's where we began to expand dramatically the services and support that Social Security would provide, Medicaid, Medicare, prescription drugs. 
and there was always this perception there will always be a lot more young people than old people. And the young people will be able to enter the workforce and provide lots of services for the elderly. The problem is, what was elderly back then, I do not perceive as elderly anymore. The world has changed. The bottom line is retirement age. By the way, 65 retirement age, not inferior in education. As much as a decade earlier than that. Top two lines, increase in longevity of Americans. Go back to 1960. People were going to be, have very, very few years in retirement before on average they died. Look at it today. My dad's 95. He's been retired. If he was in a normal uh, paying position, would have been retired more years right now than he would have worked. Now, he happened to run a dairy farm, so that didn't happen. But, folks, we can't continue that trend because we have one other problem. It's called birth control. Did anyone in your room ever hear of the pill? Look at 1950. These are the number of births per 1,000 women of childbearing age. We had 120 births for every 1,000 1, women of childbearing age, 1950. We are now at 60, one half the number. So what has happened? A very simple economic. We moved from having more children under five than total national population above 60, uh, 55 to today having more children, I'm sorry, having more people over 55 than total population below 21. And 70 headed to 80% of that group headed for public assistance. And in this community, none of us think they are our kids. So let's be optimistic and think all your kids are going to make it. Do you understand the financial burden they will carry to take care of you and I, and the 70 to 80 percent who don't make it in their own age group. It is unsustainable as a nation. And then you add technology to it. I'm not going to go through it tonight because of the lateness of the hour, but when you go home tonight, Google Wolf Ram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha means that Google is basically on its way out as a search engine. And that's why Google is doing all kinds of other things, like the Google Glasses and all kinds of other things. Because Wolfram Alpha is so much more powerful, there is not a question you can ask Wolfram Alpha that it can't answer. <laughs> let me just give you a snapshot of it. Uh, let me show you. This guy's going to come on. He's going to talk. In the little yellow bar, he will type in questions. I didn't know if you could read the questions, so I put the big red bar on the top. The first question he's going to ask is, how much is 2 plus 2? Not a trick question. The answer is 4. Watch. It happens exactly as I show it to you, as fast as I show it to you. But let me show you a little bit of what you can already do with Wolfram Alpha today. The basic idea of Wolfram Alpha is very simple. You type your input, your question, and Wolfram Alpha produces a result. Let's try something really easy. Okay, that's good. Now let's try something harder. How about some serious math? So you can type things in pretty much however you want. Here's what Wolfram Alpha produces. It's done the integral, and then it's showing us other things that it thinks we'll be interested in. And it happens that fast. How about something more real world? Let's ask it the GDP of France. Here's the result, and then it gives a plot of the history and so on. But we can dress up the question a bit if we want. We can say, what is the GDP of France? Question mark. Same result. Let's try this. What is the GDP of France slash Italy? So we as humans can tell what this is asking. And so can Wolfram Alpha, and it gives us the result. 
I'm going to stop. It goes on for a long time. There's not a question you can ask it. It can't answer instantly. I found out about it about a year ago from a group of high school seniors when I was talking with a group of seniors, and they told me about it. And they also asked me not to tell their teachers. <laughs> Literally. You know why? Because they said they are using it for their homework. What did I hear today from two of your teachers this afternoon? That they found that the one, two, it, it was a math teacher told me, that suddenly these kids were doing just great on everything. Why? They bought Wolfram Alpha. Some of you were in the audience today. How much does it cost? $2.99. It's an app. It's the world they live in. Um, by the way, it can do a term paper for you today. You can ask a que uh, give it a topic, the number of sources you want quoted, the reading level you want it written at, and it'll write up the 16,000 word term paper for you. It's on the market as we speak, $2.99. And all the kids know about it. Let me take you further. How many in your room own a iPhone or some device like this by a show of hands, okay? Somebody in your room hand me one. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, can you get email on these things, folks? Can you get total internet access? Okay, good. Let me go back and ask again. How many of, your kid, how many of you wanted your kids to become independent in the next decade? Okay. What are some of the basic skills they might need? Would it be things like knowing how to use resources and how to work with others? Am I right? Okay. Um, I have a problem with this at my age. Does anybody know what my problem is with it? I can't see it. And who can use this keyboard? The answer? The kids. Can they do it without looking? Can they do it within their pocket? Do you let the kids use these when they take the state test? No, of course not. Why? Tell me why we wouldn't let them use it. There's a good reason. They would what? Cheat. Exactly. Tell me how they would cheat. They go online, find the answer. What else might they do? They text each other. <laughs> Darn kids. They might either use, use resources or work with others. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our schools have become museums. Let me show you why. Some of the staff here heard me speak about a year ago, and I showed some devices. Can anybody see in this picture what this person is doing right here? What is that? What's that person doing? They're taking a picture with this, aren't they? This is 2005, Pope Benedict. Permit me to show you our new pope. That's how fundamentally technology has changed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, here's the problem. They have come out with something called the smartwatch. Three different, Apple, Samsung, and Sony all released smartwatches in the last, uh, this month, in the month of September. Sold over two million of them. You know what it is? It's this in a watch. Now I got a bigger problem. If I can't see this, what am I going to do with this? It does, it's not a problem because on the side of it, you push a button, what's ever on the face is projected on the wall, tabletop, or piece of paper. Push a second button, and a keyboard appears right in front of you. Separate monitors and keyboards, as you now know them, are about to disappear. They're about, that's on the market right now. They're about to put it in earrings, necklaces, and bracelets. Bill Gates says within two years, he believes they'll put it in buttons of clothes. See, technology is not slowing up. It's speeding up. Because it's going to be put in buttons of clothes. You're a board member, right? OK. I want the, you decide which one of you want to take the lead on this one. Now, here, you're the local paper, right? Okay, he can get you in a local paper. I can get you in USA Today. Okay? Okay, but let's work together. Um, I want one of you three as board members to take the lead. Because this technology over the next couple of years is going to be in buttons of clothes, 
Well, first of all, you probably will, and this is not a joke, you're probably going to have to say no watches this spring on the SIG test. Two million have been sold already. Same reason you got these. But within two years, buttons are closed. So I want you to be the first school board in America to propose that all kids shall take all tests naked. <laughs> and if somebody gives you a hard time, say, look, we're solving another problem, at least at the high school level. The boys will show up for the test. <laughs> it is crazy. When is this technology going to stop? But you know what? That what we see in our consumer lives, some of you work in the private sector, you see every day in the private sector. Technology has transformed the American workplace. Whose was this? Okay. I'm getting nervous. And so, that is all this technology and the global competition is what led to why the new standards say college and career ready. Because we have a problem. Let's see. I already asked you the question, do you want your kids to go to college? But they're coming home, many of them, functionally unemployable. Why? I'm going to challenge your assumptions about higher ed. This is a survey just released by ACT. And the new survey by ACT simply says that kids, uh, how well are kids prepared to do freshman college work? 89% of high school teachers in America this spring said they were well prepared. 26% of college professors thought they were. Now, what I'm going to show next, none of this will be your children. These are all about some other kids. That's the percentage of kids in remediation. 51.7% of kids who enter two-year colleges in the country last year took one or more remediated courses. 19% in our four-year colleges were in remediated courses. By the way, I told the Association of University Presidents how to solve this. You know how to solve it? Stop taking them. If they're not ready, don't admit them. And you know what their response was? We can't do that. Why not? We have seats to fill. Please listen carefully, folks. There are more freshman college seats in America today than there are freshmen to fill them. And nobody wants to talk about it. It's called supply and demand. Now, get in the premier universities, which I know every one of your children will be in. Yes, that is competitive. But I can drop out of high school today and go to college. I can't go to the military, however. And what I'm going to show you is I also can't go to work and be self-sufficient. This is the retention rate between the first and second year in American colleges last year. The opposite of this is our first year dropout rates. I would like to have this school district beginning this coming spring not only report out what percentage of this year's seniors are going to college, I'd like to have you report out how the kids who graduated four years ago, how many of them have completed college. Twenty-nine point one percent of our students nationwide in our two-year schools receive a degree in three years. 36.6% of our students who enter four-year colleges complete a degree in five years. Let me now take you to Ohio data. This is national data. This is every state in the country, by the way. That's the national average. Here's Ohio. You have 30.3% of your kids completing four-year colleges in four years, you have 52% completing in six years. And that's the good news. Permit me to show you the two-year college data for the state of Ohio, just released by College Board, published in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Five point two percent. 
that is a 95% dropout rate. And nobody is talking about it. And by the way, you see it says 100% here and 13% and graduate and 150%. The reason it says that in two-year colleges, there are one-year certificate programs, there are three-year certificate programs, there are two-year associate degree programs. This is the program they enter. And everybody thinks it's somebody else's kid. <laughs> Let me keep going. So are they career ready? Month of August, we had 13 million people in this country filing for unemployment insurance. This does not include all the people who ran out of their 99 weeks. But at the exact same moment, we had 3.8 million jobs that in pays in excess of $50,000 a year that are unfilled. 13 million unemployed, 3.6 million jobs, it's 3.8 million jobs, pay over 50,000, they can't find workers for. What's wrong with the picture? What's wrong with the picture is America changed. And what you major in matters a lot. Those that do graduate, 53.6% of those with a baccalaureate degree under the age of 25 are either jobless or unemployed. And remember, most of them don't make it through college. This is the 10 most common US majors last year in American universities in rank order. Number one is general uh, business. Number two is general studies. What is it? It is no major. It is come, stay as long as you would like. You can read the list, rank order. Right behind these, now let me put the seven most industrialized nations of the world. Business remains number one, general studies drops to last. Number two, for the rest of the, the industrialized world is engineering and technology. It is eighth for us. Number three, computer information sciences. Tenth for us. We seem not to want to tell the kids that what you major in matters. We seem not to want to tell them it's not what you took. It's what you can do with what you took. 48% of our four-year college graduates in the country are now on jobs that require less than a four-year degree. There's a mismatch going on between education and the 21st century workplace. That's why the new standards say college and career ready, not or. Problem is, from our old days, in the 20th century, we hear college and career ready. You know how we translate it? We translate it as college prep or career and tech ed. That's not what this is. This is college and career ready. And it doesn't mean every kid takes a career and tech ed program. It means they have to learn how, how to apply knowledge. And I'll show you a, a quick example in a moment. Look at that data. See what happened is in the 60s and the 70s, the 1960s and the 1970s, even into the 80s, technology began to expand. And as technology expanded, what it began to do is whittle away the low-wage jobs. Technology has become an increasingly sophisticated, so it's now whittling away the middle jobs. It's what they call the missing middle. And we have a lot of young people who in the past with just simply a good basic education, would be in the middle. Now what happens is, if they don't have a skill and their job is eliminated, they don't have the ability to move up here, they're moving down here and moving back home with you. It's a shift in the workplace and it is not unique to the United States. 
it's what we find throughout the industrialized world. The difference is the, uh, the industrialized world, most of it has responded by making sure kids are in majors and have skills that are compatible with the workplace. Purpose of fifth grade math is to get, in America, however, is to get kids ready for sixth grade. Elementary school math, get them ready for middle school. Middle school, get them ready for high school. High school, get them ready for college until they fall off the educational ladder and move back home. And then the cost of higher education has really escalated. It's been twice the rate of inflation for the last 17 years. ACT just released a report on everything I'm just describing this past Friday. It was on several of the talk shows yesterday morning on the, uh, the Sunday morning talk shows across the country. Uh, average child is leaving school $26,600 in debt. This is the increase in inflation from 1978 to 2012. Increase in the cost of food in the country went up slightly over 200%. The consumer price indexed about 250%, shelter about 360%. We all know medical care has gotten very expensive. It went up about 580%. This is the cost of higher education. And increasingly, the nation is beginning to say, time out. Now, I still want the kids to go to college, please understand but they need to be prepared for something when they leave college. Now to do that, it's a different set of skills. And the different set of skills is you simply don't have to have knowledge. You have to have the ability to apply knowledge. So we're gonna try one simple question with you right now. I honestly want everybody in the room to try to answer this question. Hopefully you might have paper and pencil. If not, you'll have to just try to figure it out off the top of your head. How many have ever heard in driving of the two second rule in driving? What's it mean? Anybody? You're supposed to have two seconds between you and the car in front of you for safety reasons, right? I got a simple question. This is all you need to know to answer the question. Two second rule. We drill it in the head of high school kids when they're learning how to drive. How many feet do you need between you and the car in front of you if you're going 30 miles an hour? And how many feet do you need between you and the car in front of you if you're going 60 miles an hour? Got the question? Try to answer it. Give you three minutes. Think about it. Okay, I'm going to stop you. I didn't really give you three minutes, but I want you to think about it for a second. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a new, one of the new questions on eighth grade math. The Common Core State Standards has a, ser a new set of questions. They're different than the old questions. They are changing your state test. They're changing them in every state in the country. They're also changing the SATs and the ACTs for one reason. Historically, we tested with paper and pencil test. And do we have anybody in this room that went to school in the state of New York? Did you ever hear of the New York State Regents exams? I ran them for 11 years, okay? Uh, state of testing is we test at level one and two. You want your kids to be independent? What two numbers on this list will they have to function at? One and two or four and five? Just look at it and read it for a moment and tell me. What two numbers will they have to function at to become independent? What do you think, folks? Four and five. Hey, did you get the answer over here? Very good. 88 feet at 30 miles an hour. What about 60? All you got to do is double it. Yeah, 176. 88 feet, 60 miles an hour. I mean 30 miles an hour, 176 feet at 60 miles an hour. Now to answer that question, you've got to be able to function at level four and five. See, what you've got to know is you've got to know the eighth grade science standards. And an eighth grade science standard is distance equals rate times time. You've got to be able to convert 
miles into feet. You got to be able to convert hours into seconds. I just gave you third and fifth grade math and eighth grade science. I gave you an eighth grade reading level if you actually had to read it. And it's a new one of the eighth grade math test questions. I have challenged Brian in the school district to do this. I want you to begin to run in the next few weeks some test questions. And honestly, I think it'd be a great activity for the weekly. Run, uh, Brian can get you test questions for third graders, fourth graders, fifth, eighth. The various questions are going to face. And I want you to put them in the paper and not give the answer till the following week. And then just ask, are you smarter than a fifth grader when you give the fifth grade questions? Because you know what first gonna, was going to happen? Clear as clear can be, in Ohio, your test questions have always been at level one and two. They're moving to level four and five. And as it has been field tested across your state, the kids are failing the test at an incredible rate. Why? Because nobody has ever asked them to apply knowledge before. We've asked them to recall knowledge. Now, knowledge is still important. I still got to have one and two or I can't do four and five. But I can have all the one and two in the world and no ability to do four and five. The new assessments are going to be actually more academically rigorous than their present assessments. That I don't think will be a problem for this community. You'll be able to compete on that one. The one you're going to have a problem with is the application of knowledge. Because historically, we regulated, certified, tenured, and contracted our schools around individual disciplines. And I can't get to four and five one discipline at a time. The real world doesn't function in disciplines. It is interdisciplinary. So they're going to change the test. Ladies and gentlemen, you got good schools. You moved some of you to this community because of your schools. I'm not too concerned about the academic rigor in terms of where the new assessments and standards are going. I'm much more concerned about whether the kids will be able to handle the application of knowledge across disciplines. It will require the staff to go through fairly extensive professional development because we've operated in silos for years. And when the new test results come out a year from now, the results are going to drop. To make sure people understand ahead of time, we need to get some of these questions out. That's why I'd love to have the newspaper run some of these questions, let people see them, begin a dialogue around them, and then begin a dialogue, what do we need to do to prepare the kids and the faculty for this changing world? If you only want to be prepared for college, you don't have to know how to apply knowledge. If you want to be prepared for the world beyond college, application of knowledge becomes critical. When they added the word college and career ready, they moved up to level four and five in this chart. And that's what's going to trip us. But until you know why they did it, what will happen is a lot of parents will get really mad when the kid doesn't do well. We'll blame the school. We'll blame the teacher. Well. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want them to be independent, hope your school district will take them to level four and five. No, just one and two. Thank you for listening to me tonight. Thank you for being concerned. Uh, too often, it's hard to get parents out uh, and community members out. Thank you for turning out tonight. You've been a great audience. Brian, thanks for the opportunity. Dr. Daggett, thank you. Um, folks, now you can understand why I could sit at this man's feet and just listen to what he has to say. And, and he challenges us, and, and it's a wake-up call. Uh, we were talking at dinner tonight, all the administrators, about, you know, I've been in this business for 32 years and been an administrator for 21, and there's been more change in the last four or five years than there were the previous 17 all added together. And that, and that rope, uh, the ball on the string, it's just getting faster and faster and faster. Um, and, and we don't have any choice because uh, there are kids and we got to educate them and, and provide the best for them. So, Dr. Daggett, I, again, I thank you very, very much. I know of all the places you're going to be this week, this was the highlight, and I, and I respect you and appreciate your work very much. Thank you. Folks, thank you so much for coming out. Appreciate it.